So uh, today's guest is uh, Stefan George from uh, Gnosis, and Gnosis is a very influential product in the in the space. It, you know, they secure over forty billion dollars of assets through Gnosis Safe, which is you know it's like a just industry standard for most DAOs to secure their assets. But also, if you ever used POAP, you probably use Gnosis Safe because under the hood, it's helping us to get all these NFTs to record our attendance at different events. So, you know, Stefan, you're like real OG. You've been here when Ethereum at Consensus and all the projects that we use have been formed. So it's been a long time ago. So could you tell us you know, what chain of events led you to Gnosis? Because as far as I know, it's been incubated at Consensus back then. Sure, yeah. Thanks for having me, uh, Mac. It's a great opportunity to be here. Um, yeah, so it's dating back quite a while. So we initially started even before Ethereum working on applications for Bitcoin in 2013 and uh, then we early on discovered Ethereum. Um, we met Joe Lubin, the founder of, of Ethereum, or one of the founders of Ethereum and Consensus, uh, very early on. And he convinced us to join Consensus to build Gnosis. So we already had the idea of building uh, decentralized prediction markets. And he convinced us to, to join Consensus. And we were very early there as well, uh, maybe employee number three and four. Uh, and uh, yeah, then we. Yeah, we started building yeah, Gnosis as part of consensus um, because we saw the opportunity to to build like really decentralized prediction markets. And at that time, I think prediction markets were one of the most anticipated applications for Ethereum. Um, fast forward, things are quite different today. And Gnosis has also developed in many different ways. Uh, and I think today, as you mentioned, like if you ask people what does Gnosis do, then many will probably say Gnosis safe, even though that's actually not what we do anymore. <laughs> the safe became a spin-off from Gnosis and now it's just safe. Um, and uh, Gnosis is now focusing on our own network, Gnosis chain, Gnosis chain, <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, on which actually props are being issued. So yes, so if you are, if you're an owner of a, of a prop, then this prop has been issued on Gnosis chain. So, you know, like Stefan, how was building things on Ethereum back then, because it was like 2014, as far as I remember. So it's been like super early, early days. Yeah, fun times, <laughs> because as, uh, as you said, like we basically started developing on Ethereum before Ethereum was even live itself, or like before the Ethereum network um, was actually live. So we, we basically developed a lot on the test environments of Ethereum test nets, the first test nets. Uh, all the iterations of it and at that time everything was breaking every every other day <laughs> so on the one hand uh, it was quite of uh, kind of annoying to kind of always adopt to everything that's changing constantly like ethereum itself was a moving target on the other hand it also made rapid progress so um, like the language solidity changed a lot um, also how the blockchain behaved changed a lot in a very short time the EVM developed almost on a weekly basis. So kind of what we uh, what we do now in a couple of years time in terms of implementing changes in hard forks is kind of happened in a very tiny amount of time. So like kind of like a hard fork every other day, basically. <laughs> and uh, so it was also exciting, <laughs> but it was also challenging because obviously there was no developer tooling. There was hardly anything available to, to make your life easier. Um, and so we also started contributing to this kind of experience and, uh, but it was good times. So we were lucky to also work together with the Ethereum foundation in the same office. At the time, the foundation had only one real office, which was in Berlin. And, um, we were also, or like, I was also based in Berlin at the time. And so we worked hand in hand with those developers, which also created a nice feedback loop. So we could always give feedback directly on how, uh, the language develops and uh, take advantage of this as well, of course. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, that you, you were like one of the first applications on Ethereum, but you also like made an iteration or even a pivot because, you know, you were about to start with the prediction markets, but your product evolved. So could you tell us like why it happened? 
Sure, yeah. So as I said, like kind of prediction markets, I think was one of the most anticipated applications for Ethereum at the time. So we're also not the only ones trying to do this. There's actually another project called Augur, um, which tr tried to also build decentralized prediction markets. And they actually did the first ICO um, ever on Ethereum. And they were able to raise a lot of uh, capital. So at the time they raised uh, over 5% of the Ether supply. Um, in the ICO. Oh God. And also in addition to that, an equal amount of Bitcoin or even more. And so they were very well funded. And uh, we saw, even though Orga was kind of ahead of the game at the time, we saw there's room for competition and we are going to build the main competitor to Orga, which was Gnosis. And um, yeah, then we also did an ICO in 2017. And um, yeah, we already had iterated a couple of times on the idea of prediction markets. Um, but the reality was that uh, people did not care too much about prediction markets. Um, and even though there were different versions of prediction markets being released by many different teams, no one really ever used them to an extent that was really like meaningful mm -hmm. <laughs> um, or also uh, showing that there was a real business behind this. Obviously there were already like other like real world, let's say prediction markets, like, mm -hmm. or like, like in the fiat world, there were a couple of sports betting websites that allowed peer to peer sports betting, which is kind of equivalent to, to prediction markets. Um, but on blockchain, I think there are multiple reasons why this never took off. Like for example, users are used to to speculate on many assets in blockchain. So they don't need another way to speculate necessarily where the upside is limited yeah. as in prediction markets. Also, uh, prediction markets usually work well in, in, in niche markets where you have insider information that can be traded. Um, but then you also have to have those insiders on your platform. And that was also a challenge. So the only insider markets that actually worked well were uh, Ethereum related. So for example, we had one market on the um, release date of Ethereum 2 mm -hmm. and that was actually an interesting market because obviously a lot of Ethereum core developers are uh, also be are able to participate in those markets and so this market created quite some controversy um, but yeah beyond those uh, it was nothing that was really like driving a lot of adoption or volumes and so it was always more like a niche and um, at the same time, when we did the ICO, it was clear that we were still at the very beginning of building the ecosystem. So a lot of components were missing. So for example, as part of the ICO, Gnosis ICO, we, in, we also built a multi-signature wallet, which allowed to store the proceeds of the ICO itself. And it turned out that this was actually much more useful than the prediction market at the time, because many ICOs followed, they all used the same infrastructure. And so that's kind of was the the birth of the multisig becoming very popular and trusted. And then we did an iteration of this, which was a Gnosis safe, which was um, a bit more generic, could fit more use cases, uh, was much more gas efficient. So it was more future proof to, to what Ethereum is today. And um, yeah, that was kind of the beginning of the story of the multisig and uh, turning this into like a really big success story mm -hmm. um, by yeah, developing trust over time. And uh, we also did other things. We also worked a lot on exchange infrastructure uh, and the product that resulted out of this uh, research was Cowswap, which is also yeah, one of the most used um, yeah, decentralized exchanges uh, and yeah, mm -hmm. offers you to, to get the best price basically and being protected from MEV. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like have, building multisig is is a very hard thing in a sense that on one hand it needs to be absolutely safe because of course it's like the core feature of, of it. But on the other hand, you need to have good UX because people who use multisigs are often at different level of technical capabilities. I might say. Uh, so how have you managed to? do it because like I, I used safe and it's super clean very intuitive even though under the hood there is a lot of things going on yeah good question so also i have to say this uh, was not something that happened immediately so if you look at like the first versions of the notes safe 
And also the Nose Multisig then uh, would not necessarily say that it had great user experience. <laughs> uh, and that resulted also from the fact that we, um, yeah, that we required like security was always first, like you first have to build something that's secure and then uh, even you can start improving on security. And so the first versions of the uh, Multisig UI were actually very close to the contract itself. So it kind of just showed what was happening in the contract. And uh, that was really bare bone. And if you were not a developer, I think you could hardly understand what was going on. And then we started adding convenience features to make it more readable of like what does the transaction data actually entails and who, is, who has to sign and so on. Um, and the same happened with the save as well. At the beginning, it was very bare bone. Um, and then over time, we added more and more convenience features. And we also built a mobile app for it uh, to make it easy for you to sign and understand what's going on. And so this just user experience just takes a lot of time. So security in terms of building a secure smart contract, it's one thing, but then building a great user experience is actually also just a lot of great engineering, you have a lot of great user research. So we had uh, quite a few user researchers also understanding of how people are using it. And, and then improving on. So it's just a lot of work, basically. <laughs> so there's no magic behind it. It's just like uh, trying to build a great product. And it always takes time. Um, I think for us, it was always very important that security is never compromised. So also when improving user experience, you should never be at the expense of, of, of security. Quite the opposite. We want users to really understand what they're signing. Um, we put a lot of effort into that. Um, but still, yeah, trying to make it as easy as possible mm -hmm. for people to sign off. It is still a challenge today. I would say even today, there's still a lot of improvements that can be done, especially in the context of understanding what you're actually signing. Mm -hmm. um, but you made a lot of progress with integration. So it's also not everything that you see in the UI is all like built by us, but there are many things where we leverage partners that also help us to build a better product, like mm -hmm. Tenderly, for example, to simulate what transactions are doing and um, yeah, make you aware of what the outcome is if you actually sign this. Mm -hmm. And how have you acquired first users back then? Was it like, okay, we built, you know, this multi-sig for us to, to secure our ICO assets and other people just started asking you about it or was it, you know, somehow differently? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, actually, also a good lesson learned here, like we build something for ourselves and in crypto, if you build something for yourself, then quite likely you're also serving the need of other people, actually. <laughs> and this is what's happened here. So we build this for ourselves and then even without even asking us and even without being aware that there's a security audit or not, people started using it. So I, I just remember that even before our own ICO, okay. uh, Gollum, like the Gollum project that raised I think 400,000 ether, um, oh they God. started using this multisig and, uh, yeah, I remember like a friend called me and said like, oh, look at this, like it was just an ICO and they used this contract and, uh, it was, I was a bit shocked, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, they did it and they didn't even contact us beforehand. They were just assuming, I guess, that the contract is safe. And, uh, I, in, in hindsight, they told me they also did an audit on it. Um, but yeah, this was uh, fun times and, uh, yeah, we just were, I guess, kind of lucky enough to, um, be a first mover in building the core piece, mm -hmm. but also building it, uh, in a way that others really trusted it and that there was no need to build something else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, right now safe moved to like safe DAO, as far as I know. So I'm wondering, like, why have you spun off this project outside of Gnosis and made it, you know, more decentralized? What was the goal here and, and how it looked like? Yeah, good question. So it was actually like a long ongoing discussion also with the Gnosis, uh, if this is something like we should do or not. Ultimately, there were a couple of factors that were playing into this. So one requirement, of course, for a spin-off is that you have people that are capable of leading the project. Uh, that's kind of necessary, obviously. And I think we were lucky enough to, to have uh, on our teams, so the SAFE, but also Cowslop have really like great people that were great leaders that had their own uh, vision for how the product should move forward. Um, and who were also proving themselves already with the Gnosis when they were still part of Gnosis that they're capable of executing this. And I think then the second factor that played into this was also that we saw the opportunity to, 
to give those teams a lot more freedom and develop much faster uh, by actually being independent um, and also the opportunity to um, to give them more let's say resources in order to to make progress so they were both able to do a fundraise um, independent of noses mm -hmm. and uh, yeah i think now they're really well off in terms of having enough resources to grow really fast and um, yeah and the, i think the also the speed of development has increased a lot as us it's a lot also about giving people agency and responsibility and um, that we did anyways even before we did the spin-offs we gave people a lot of responsibilities and uh, freedom in order to to develop the things as they think it would make sense and that also allowed them to to grow into these responsibilities and yeah makes this spin-off mm -hmm. successful okay and, and how does it look like how did it look like on a you know technical process level so because you know you were a company that that had a product so you know how have you actually like moved this asset to another team and and, and how how have you decided like how how to form it and you know how to create this DAO? very good question so i mean on a technical level that was actually i mean it took time but uh, at least in terms of ip there was not much to be transferred because everything we do is open source um so on that level there's there's not a lot to be transferred uh it's of course about the teams being able to go on of their own uh, for this we created a few new companies the team also itself understood like okay what is the best setup for us to do the fundraise and so on and uh, it was a little bit similar maybe to how also gnosis spun up from consensus <laughs> so we had a lot of independence already in consensus to prepare for the spin-off um probably even more than our team said uh and um yeah and then it was really a big open question was of course like what does the how does how is gnosis dao being compensated for this especially uh, given that the safe was seen as the main product for Gnosis, uh, there had to be a clear answer to this. There was a lot of ongoing discussions also, like what is the percentage owned by, by Gnosis DAO? Um, and uh, yeah, that took, took a while, but ultimately I think everyone was uh, happy with the result. <laughs> and, uh, and then we were able to kind of, yeah, delegate those assets to Safe DAO. And uh, mm -hmm. also the team was anyways already working kind of um, with hypnosis as one unit. So it was mm -hmm. not too difficult to decide, okay, who's going to join SAFE now and who will remain at, at, at hypnosis. So I would say the whole process took about one year, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, of course, this process was also uh, yeah, included also doing the fundraise, which in itself, of course, took also quite some time. Um, but yeah, it was ultimately I would say a pretty smooth transition so mm -hmm. far at least, yeah. Hey, if you like this episode, here's a short break because you can actually meet Stefan in person and you can meet him on Epic Web Conference organized by our partner. And this conference is special because just like podcast, it's focused exclusively on building and growing web free products. So they have a very strong lineup. There are people from MetaMask, Ledger, Decentraland, Poap, MakerDAO, Zerion, and many, many more. Uh, Stefan, of course, will be there as well. So if you would like to learn more, go to epicwebfree.com and all our subscribers get 15% off. So if you decide to buy a ticket, during checkout, just type in Web3 Talks code and you will get 15% off. So thanks a lot. And we are returning to the episode. Okay. Uh, and, you know, let's get to Gnosis chain. Uh, like, why have you built your own chain? Because this is a huge project to do. And there are many chains right now competing. You've been, you've been here quite early. Uh, and and if, for sure, like you are, I guess, one of the oldest Ethereum side chains, as far as I know. But like, why have you decided to build it in the first place? Good question. So 
as you said, like we actually did not build it ourselves. We actually merged with an existing sidechain, XDAI. And uh, well, XDAI has some interesting applications, like for example, Poop uh, is one of the uh, most used applications um, on Gnosis chain. And uh, as you said, like it's pretty difficult to bootstrap an ecosystem and create like a successful network. And that's why we decided to, uh, instead of building our own, <laughs> We continue operating an existing one and uh, try to give it a new perspective. And that's what we did with XDAI. So us being like a, an application developer on, on top of, of Ethereum, we were very, very well positioned also to, to bring more applications to that time XDAI, now Gnosis chain. And when we did this, we also decided to change the technical roadmap of the network. So we, we kind of left the path of being a simple Proof of authority network, what Prop used to be, uh, and change it to yeah follow the Ethereum roadmap. So we launched our Open Beacon chain um, and yeah follow the Ethereum stack, which also makes us like hundred percent compatible to to Ethereum and the future Ethereum upgrades. Um, we actually call now uh, Gnosis chain more like a sister chain to Ethereum, which kind of requires us to have the same stack, and uh, we kind of like name this like the Ethereum verse. So a bit similar to the Cosmos verse, where you have multiple, uh, multiple layer one uh, chains, which are connected via IBC. We create the Ethereum verse, where you have multiple kind of instances of Ethereum running in parallel, which are connected via light client based bridges. So very similar to how IBC works, we created a protocol like a ZK bridge between uh, the two networks, which allows to verify um, the beacon chain consensus um, from one chain on the other, and obviously vice versa. And that creates a very like secure environment for everyone who wants to, to operate um, and use information from the other network. And uh, yeah, today Gnosis chain is the yeah, second most decentralized network, I would say, or maybe third after Bitcoin and Ethereum. We have about 120,000 validators uh, securing the network run by I think 1,700 nodes, um, so run by individuals and companies. And uh, that makes it a super resilient network. We think that uh, there's demand for decentralized block space. Obviously, Ethereum is one of the few networks which really runs at capacity <laughs> constantly. Um, and we just uh, think there's the, yeah, we have to offer more of what is really needed, which is decentralized mm -hmm. block space. Um, other, other networks are really trying to kind of compete more on the scalability side. Um, but today we have an abundant amount of cheap block space and fast block space, but there's very few uh, decentralized block space. And that's mm -hmm. what we double down on. And um, yeah, we, we see that there's quite a few applications, especially let's say more uh, financial applications that can benefit from having like credible neutral uh, execution environment. Um, and yeah, that's what we can do. Like that's what we can offer. Mm -hmm. uh, like a network that is clearly not biased towards one jurisdiction, um, a network that is really credible neutral where you as a developer, you can deploy your application and it will be there <laughs> um, also in the future. And you don't have to trust like a few entities uh, to execute it. And we, I would like to compare it a bit to the safe. So for the safe, we we developed safe, but it took quite some time for people to gain trust and move their assets over to this net to, to this contract. And today, as you said, like it has billions and billions of dollars being secured by safe contracts. So I kind of want to get to the same with Gnosis chain. So today, uh, TVL of Gnosis chain is rather low, but we have been creating a very secure and very reliable infrastructure that should allow users to store very significant value on this network. So I kind of want you and everyone else to store your life savings on this network and also obviously bring utility that incentivizes you to do so. So we're working with a lot of like real world asset providers, uh, which are now natively issuing uh, those assets on Osis chain, um, which allow you to yeah, have a very attractive uh, yeah, financial products to earn yield and uh, yeah, and at the same time have a secure environment for you to, to keep those assets. Mm -hmm. Okay, Stefan, so like, let's take a step back, uh, like a little bit, because you said that you have over 120,000 validators, which is a lot. 
to say <laughs> the least. So, you know, decentralization is one of the hardest things to build because, you know, you need to have a lot of people involved around the world. Uh, so, like, how have you done it? How, how you involved so many people and entities to take part in, in the Gnosis ecosystem? So, yeah, you can think of, um, like, the requirements for you to, to run a Gnosis chain validator are very low, especially if you compare it to other networks. Um, where you have to have either, like, uh, very expensive hardware, like on Solana, for example, or you have to invest a lot of money into the token to participate in, in staking like Ethereum. Like in Ethereum, you need at least 32 Ether. That's now again, almost $60,000. So not everyone can do this, obviously. And for Gnosis Chain, we dropped those requirements to one GNO, which is about $120. And you can run it on any commodity hardware. And we even incentivized people to buy this hardware. So what we did is we, we told, uh, we, we, we had like campaigns running where you could buy a Depth Node device. So a Depth Node is a simple computer where it's very easy for you to run um, yeah, clients like a Gnosis Chain client. And uh, on top of this, we gave users uh, GNO tokens, which then they could use to participate in staking on the network. And this is a campaign that uh, went very well. So lots of people were buying the hardware and a lot of people were starting running the hardware and validating the network. And uh, I think that was a very good grassroots initiative that allowed a lot of users to be onboarded. And um, I think also, uh, yeah, we are not done with this campaign. So we actually would like to even increase this effort. And uh, we are working on a campaign that should onboard users in every country. So our goal is one metric that we have is one validator in each country. And uh, yeah, that is something that is, um, yeah, would be great to see. Like if you see this map, I don't know if you've seen this map for Ethereum, um, but if you look at Ethereum, for example, it's very like centered around Europe and US. That's where pretty much all the validators are, validators are running. And we would like to create more diversity uh, and have validators really everywhere. So we don't create networks which are biased towards one geographical location and then potentially being prone to, to regulation in those countries. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because of this global approach, do you see a different geographical mix when it comes to people that use or build on top of Gnosis chain? Do you have more people from, you know, Asia, South America, Africa, or Australia? Um, I would say that's too early. Like the campaign, I mean, has been of course going on for a while and we, we see some developers of course coming from those locations, but I would not say that this has really changed a lot. I think that also comes with the fact that most developers are also based in Europe and US. So it kind of comes together. Um, but I think uh, at least we have kind of a foot in the door in many other countries, um, which are, uh, yeah, which are not yet as familiar with Web3 as, as we are in Europe or United States. Um, so for me, it's just a matter of time. And mm -hmm. uh, I think quite likely if you're already running a node uh, for such a network, then it's also already more likely that if you develop something, you are developing on mm -hmm. this network. Okay. And, you know, you mentioned these new use cases on, on Gnosis chain, the things that people can actually do there. So could you expand on that? Like give some examples that, you know, uh, might be like tangible and we can really imagine like what we can do and, and maybe even after listening to that, go on and test how it works. Yes, absolutely. So, yeah, so um, one field that we would like to double down on for Gnosis Chain are real world assets or generally the theme of like, how do we connect to the real world, right? Like if you look at, at blockchain today, like what is actually being used and there are really only two kind of field of applications that drive pretty much all the demand for transactions. This is DeFi, NFTs, DeFi NFTs trading, I would say generally speculation. So like NFT marketplaces, uh, decentralized exchanges for ERC20 tokens. This is kind of the number one application. And then we have games uh, like blockchain native games, um, which are run on the cheaper networks like Polygon, Gnosis Chain, Binance Smart Chain, right? The, this is kind of really at this point uh, what is driving most users right now today and then there's nothing else 
And so we believe that uh, one big driver for additional adoption, which obviously has to happen, uh, will be to connect much more closely to, to real world and allow users to, to kind of use blockchain more in their daily lives. And um, for this, we are working together with a few projects which will allow to do this. So one project is called Oli, which is a, a payment card and uh, like a Visa card. But at the same time, this card is also a hardware wallet. So um, you can actually, when you tap somewhere to pay, you are actually signing a transaction on Gnosis chain. Mm -hmm. And then this transaction is injected into the Visa transaction itself. It is sent via the Visa protocol. The processor receives this Visa transaction, including also the crypto transaction. The processor in this case is us. So we can verify that the user has actually signed this. And then we can confirm to Visa that we received the money. They can settle this transaction um, been feared to the merchant and uh, yeah, we can settle it on chain. So you can have a direct link between like you paying in a coffee shop and you spending your die or euro or whatever you have on Gnosis chain um, in this one single transaction. And that allows to create a, also ultimately like a complete new, new payment network. So something where um, you can create your own payment scheme uh, you can upgrade potentially the point of sale systems to accept crypto directly and then have like a pure peer-to-peer -peer payment experience. And that should really change the game of how merchants and, and customers are interacting. And obviously payment is something that you do on your yeah, daily basis actually a couple of times. So it creates already a very different perspective of how you deal with crypto, which is very tangible. Um, and well, obviously you also have the benefit of having money in a non-custodial account where you have no access to every, all the beautiful applications that we built uh, around, uh, around our blockchain application. And so I could think, for example, if you next time go to a coffee shop and the coffee shop actually, uh, is aware of the system, they could start issuing like, uh, like co-ops for every purchase you do, and then mm -hmm. use it as sort of a loyalty system, for example. Um, but there are many other ways, of course, how I think the merchant can then start communicating with the client or with the customer. And um, yeah, and around this experience, we also try to build everything else that the user might need, right? Like, for example, we work with a fiat on off-ramp called Monerium. And uh, what makes them special is that they tightly integrate into the SEPA system. So SEPA is what we use in Europe to do every transfer, right? It's like we all have done it many times. And the cool thing is now the way Monarium works is that you, they generate an IBAN for you. You can send euros to this IBAN and then they immediately issue euro tokens on chain. And that can go within one minute. So mm. you can onboard from fiat euro to crypto euro in one minute and at zero slippage at zero cost. So by definition, that's the cheapest way and the best user experience you can have to go in euro. And also vice versa, going out of Europe, because now you can actually trigger a SEPA transfer with an on-chain transaction. <laughs> mm. uh, and I can, I don't know, in a safe transaction, I can combine 100 SEPA trans transfers to random people or whatever. And um, so that kind of implies for you also that you can have your bank account on-chain. So you can have all your rules, non-custodial wallet, which you can spend also in the regular fiat world via regular bank transfers and via the payment card anywhere where you want to pay. Um, that is already quite a lot of what, what your actual bank does. Uh, and now on top of this, we also work with a company called Backed Finance. And what they offer is they offer different like one-to-one -one backed financial um, yeah, products such as stocks, ETFs, and also fixed income products such as US treasuries. And they are now also being offered on all this chain. So <laughs> you can convert your euros to on-chain euros at no cost. And then you can start buying those assets uh, at very little slippage, very little cost um, and earn yield. Um, so <laughs> uh, with very, very low risk for yourself. And uh, yeah, that is something that is quite, quite amazing. And yeah, my personal goal is to at least get rid of some of my bank accounts I have uh, to really move on chain. And uh, I think at that point, it will become really kind of seamless the interaction between like real finance and complete on chain interaction. And I will be able to take advantage 
um, yeah, of everything else that we build around this. These are really amazing things. I mean, these are things that I have never heard of yet before. And what I really love about these solutions is these are really like the best of the two worlds. So on one hand, there's this non-custodial wallet from DeFi, which gives you freedom and real security. But on the other hand, there's this like convenience from banking and the TradFi world when it comes to investing and, you know, paying uh, every day. So I am I must say I'm very impressed. Uh, I, I, I'm really surprised that I've never heard about these projects because they are really amazing. Uh, so, you know, uh, not, not, uh, could you tell us like if they are under development or are they already, you know, ready, ready to use? So, yeah. yeah, you can be one of the first users, uh, cause they actually really, it's, it's no surprise you have never really heard of it because it's just basically deployed as we speak. Um, but for example, uh, what you can test today is the integration to a SEPA network. So you can go to monarium.com, you can create an account, you get an IBAN, you can send euros uh, from your Revolut account, for example. Uh, most banks support instant SEPA these days, so within mm -hmm. one minute, you will get these euro tokens on-chain. You can do it vice versa, off-board, from euro on-chain to euro uh, like in your bank account. Um, we also provide significant liquidity for the euro token on Gnosis chain, so it's really easy for you to convert also, let's say, you want to sell a token and you want to offboard to your bank account. Now, the cheapest and fastest way to go actually over Gnosis chain, <laughs> uh, because again, like you bypass the exchanges like Kraken or Binance, mm -hmm. and you actually save a significant amount of fees on this because on those exchanges, you always yeah. have to trade in order to get euros. So mm -hmm. you save a lot of money, uh, you're much, it's much, much faster for you. And that's something you can already do today. So already today, if you want to offboard Euro, you can go over those chain. It's the best option you have. Uh, and then secondly, um, we started uh, providing also liquidity, or like we will start providing liquidity next week for the assets I mentioned. So mm -hmm. uh, like there's S&P 500, one-to-one -one back tokens. Um, the custodian for this is actually in Switzerland. So that's actually a very like, uh, mm -hmm. trust, uh, trustworthy setup here, uh, not like USDC um, or USDT. Mm -hmm. This is like a trustworthy setup. Um, and yeah, then will be like just another trade on CowSwap or Balancer for you to get exposure to those assets. Um, and yeah, the payment card. So we are, I am, let me try to have it here in my wallet. I hope I have, mm. it must be here somewhere. Oh. Yeah, I actually do because we already, yeah, have this card here. Oh, okay. You see, it looks, it looks like a Visa card, right? Yeah, like uh, a normal card. And it is a Visa card, but it's also a hardware wallet. So this card here is as powerful as a Ledger hardware wallet, but at the fraction mm. of cost. Creating this card, creating this chip, this hardware wallet costs less than a dollar. And um, so it can either be mass produced and yeah, it's really, uh, yeah, it's not a big deal to, to create those cards. And uh, yeah, and they actually allow you to have non-custodial payments and it's actually pretty cool. So for me, obviously I can already do it. I can go and pay in the coffee shop, tap and pay. And I see the transaction corresponding transaction on my phone. Uh, and that's just a, already kind of an amazing experience that I can see that I actually spent, um, yeah, spend the, the DAI or Euro tokens that I mm -hmm. have in my wallet. And of course it allows a lot more possibilities. So I think also we will see a big ecosystem being built around this experience because now we have to build new software for merchants to to maintain and build the customer experience obviously on the on the customer side also a lot to be done yeah and uh, for me this pop use case is, is really amazing for, for these cards like having it integrated inside the card so you don't have to think about it at all seems like an, a very very good idea so uh yeah so you know uh you know there's like uh I, i'm just looking here because i have questions here so you know i'm wondering like when you're running a project such as gnosis chain what are the most important factors and metrics that you follow what's your north star when you wake up every day 
very good question as well. So I think that for, for networks, there are cuts, kind of a few metrics that are always important. Like for example, um, yeah, you have to make sure that network basically runs and that we, <laughs> that uh, like core components are actually functional. This is kind of a base requirement, but if you look at many other networks, that's actually not easy to, to actually get <laughs> yeah. Like I'm talking about bridges, I'm talking about valid data sets, I'm talking about core infrastructure like RPCs and uh, block explorers. So there's quite a bunch of stuff that you have to get sorted before you can even consider your network being a functional network. Um, so that fortunately we were able to cover quite well in the last couple of months. So now I would consider Nozchain being one of the most stable networks. It has one of the most best infrastructure providers. Um, and yeah, I, I can tell like basically the, the developers that work on those chain, they're quite happy uh, with how uh, reliable the infrastructure is at this point. Um, then of course, there's the other component, which is uh, creating demand for the network. Like what is the utilization of the network, how many transactions are being done, uh, how much value is stored on the network, um, and so on. And I think there we are still a at the beginning of the journey that I just explained to you, like this, I would say the idea of really making Gnosis chain, like a decentralized bank, like where you can really have everyone being operational on this network, being onboarded uh, to the tool that we have. And I actually think this would be a great way for us also to, um, yeah, to onboard a lot of new users that previously maybe not have had access to bank accounts. So obviously we are kind of starting right now with Europe. But uh, there are many advantages in starting in Europe, but the goal is, of course, to, to go to many other countries and uh, make it really easily accessible to anyone. And then, um, yeah, hopefully actually finally help with this perspective of uh, having more people um, included mm -hmm. in more space. Uh, and I think that will be a very exciting journey for us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, from what I've heard is that that you you know you work on zk capabilities for your network so could you expand on that like do you plan to add some privacy layer or anything like that soon right yes yeah, so a couple of components maybe zk um actually one is the bridge itself so as i mentioned we thinking about this ethereum verse and uh, we have different instance instantiation of the Ethereum uh, clients. Uh, one is Gnosis Chain and we connect it to Ethereum via a new bridge, a light client based bridge. And for this, we, yeah, we work together with the team of Succinct Labs to build a ZK based light client. And that is actually a requirement to make it even feasible because uh, there's a lot of computation necessary that has to be outsourced in a ZK circuit. Otherwise it would not be feasible to even compute this on chain. So yeah, we are, we are very happy to actually have built this and uh, very soon it will also be operational. Um, and in that sense, like ZK just allows us to even have such a solution at all. Um, yeah, and then we also have privacy functionality on Gnosis chain. Um, so we think that privacy is actually, should be like a human right actually, like you should be able to transact privately and should not be forced to make everything public as it is today. Um, unfortunately, it was perceived a bit negatively in the recent past because <laughs> yeah. um, number one demand from for privacy came from people that were hacking other people, <laughs> and that's not great. Yeah. Uh, but for me, it's pretty obvious um, that like uh, this is not the number one use case. The reason why it's right now the number one use case is because we don't have enough people right now on the network. Um, just going back to the payment use case, for example, um, if we actually have a peer to peer payment network, which is ultimately the goal of this payment initiative, right? Where, where you can directly pay the merchant and you don't have to go over another scheme, then privacy becomes a big issue because then you can always trace like, ah, this person did a purchase with this merchant, uh, about this amount. And, uh, yeah, that's something you really don't want to make public to anyone. At the same time, actually, uh, for you participating in the Visa network, you have to be KYC. Um, and I think it's a great use case where all the users on this network have to be KYC. At the same time, it's obvious that you need privacy <laughs> because you don't want to make it traceable, like who, like who is basically transacting with whom. And mm -hmm. so adding ZK to this is a no brainer. We have to do it 
um, at the beginning we won't because it's technically quite challenging actually to scale it to, to this amount of transactions but it's very clear it has to be the case in the future and so we are talking to the teams that are working on the DK technology for this and uh, as soon as we see it viable as soon as we see the demand because there are more peer-to-peer -peer transactions we will actually integrate this um, and even today there's privacy preserving layers on, on top of Gnosis chain uh, I will not promote them right now, <laughs> uh, but uh, they exist. And uh, yeah, on top of this, we also care a lot about privacy for MEV protection. So mm -hmm. uh, obviously MEV protection is something very important to us. CalSwap was kind of a result of, of this research. And um, this also strongly connect to the protection of the mempool um, to make like information in the mempool private uh, with the right now we have a public mempool and uh, we would like to give privacy to the mempool without kind of compromising on decentralization ideally and for this we work mm -hmm. with called shutter network um yeah to create a shutterized beacon chain where the transaction transactions being included are actually encrypted until the time when uh, the validators commit to include them and only then they become visible and yeah we think that will add a lot of uh, like yeah, protection to users obviously because um, there's no there's no fear of being front run if everything you do is encrypted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you know, uh, I I would like to ask you because like you've been working on Kenosis for well, like almost ten years, I guess. <laughs> yeah, more well, uh, years, but yeah, a long time. <laughs> yeah, so I'm wondering what have been the most surprising thing when you were building that because i for sure you started with some initial set of hypothesis some kind of idea what you want to build some yeah. kind of idea what people need you already mentioned the prediction market for example uh and and where the crypto is actually heading uh, because in 2013 i guess it was totally different direction so i'm wondering like how you know, how has it changed? What have you learned that was very surprising to you uh, and, and change your mind? Yeah, yeah, no. So I think at the beginning when we uh, raised capital, my expectation was that either um, we're going to make it in a couple of years time or we go bust. <laughs> um, and well, so the surprising part was that what we raised money for prediction markets actually never made it. Um, we are still here, obviously. <laughs> and uh, so I think that was a very different expectation because startups in crypto work quite differently, I would say, um, mm -hmm. compared to like, traditional startups. Uh, and uh, I think we were also, um, yeah, I guess not lucky, but we were uh, fortunate enough to, to pivot to or like always kind of do many things in parallel, all of which some really succeeded others clearly did not succeed but we we had some parts that were really clearly successful that allowed us to uh, to keep going and um yeah develop more yeah more crazy things that we think are useful <laughs> potentially useful and uh yeah i i think my perspective has changed a little bit because um like oh well, yeah i'm i'm definitely much more driven by now to just uh get the technology to a stage where we can really prove something so i feel like even though i'm working on this for eight years so far we have built technology for a very like tiny uh, percentage of humanity so if you look at like how many users are there actually in our ecosystem in terms of using decentralized applications um i would argue there's probably not more than maybe 20 million maybe 25 million users that have actually used decentralized technology. So it's a drop in the bucket. It's like 0.25% of the world population has been using crypto. And that seems uh, like not a lot to me. So <laughs> that's something I'm, I'm actually keen on changing. And uh, hopefully we can at least double it. That would already be a big success. Um, and yeah, that's, I think, something that changed for me. So I think initially it was maybe more driven also by pure like business uh, instinct and seeing opportunity. Um, now it's more like, okay, we were able to bootstrap a few interesting things, but uh, we still haven't really 
really changed a lot <laughs> in terms of mm -hmm. having a societal impact, for example. Mm. Yeah, I'm pretty sure your new products might uh, at least add some uh, to this goal. So, you know, like, so Stefan, like if you were like today, is like 20th of March, 2023. So let's say today you stop building Gnosis for whatever reason, and you have to build something else. What would you build? Well, then I would build a wave pool in Portugal. <laughs> I think that's something I would be keen on doing right now. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, it no, would be a very no, just, important project as well. <laughs> no, just kidding. But uh, I, um, no, I think there are lots of problems still that have to be solved. Uh, I would probably try to just spend time on understanding other problems and uh, how potentially you can help uh, solving them. So at this point, I would not say this is one problem which I find like is outstanding where I could really uh, help a lot, but also haven't spent too much time in thinking about other problems. So, uh, but obviously there are many problems to be solved. And I, I think technology can still help a lot in, in solving some of those challenges. So um, I think in Europe, we are very lucky to be in a place where we have, uh, besides some wars going on, it's a pretty stable environment mm. and uh, a pretty, let's say, safe environment. But that's obviously not the case in most parts of the world. And uh, I still believe that technology can change this. Of course, blockchain is more on the, let's say, the financial inclusion part at some point, hopefully. <laughs> uh, but there are also other interesting aspects like, I don't know, more secure communication. Uh, mm -hmm. I think there are lots of uh, autocratic regimes which try to really, where well, I think no one can really feel safe in how they communicate. And I think there's still a lot to be done to offer users uh, or like citizens uh, mm -hmm. better way, better means of communication. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely noble goal to uh, to do that because. You know, I also live in Europe, like I live in Poland, which is like, you know, very close to Ukraine. And it's very easy to take for granted some things. And when shit hits the fan, <laughs> then you need the technology like crypto, for example, when people were leaving Ukraine and they could just have their money on hardware wallet or, you know, on the other way around, we could send money to Ukraine to, to, to support them. and do it like from all over the world and uh, it, it was really 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 nice so you know stefan like you said you you mentioned challenges so i'm wondering you know if you had a magic wand and could fix one thing about web3 what would you fix yeah that's a hard one but uh I kind of what I'm always, or I feel like we would be kind of further ahead um, with less resources <laughs> uh, because I feel like we, like the whole space is very driven by speculation, which drives always a lot of resources in and then eventually out again in bear markets. But uh, I think this kind of, yeah, leads to also issues where like resources are definitely not effectively allocated, especially in crypto, you see so many projects doing the same thing and uh, so many networks trying to solve the same. And that also leads to this weird situation where it's really hard to collaborate um, because, uh, or like, let's say consolidate the market, which I think would be actually needed uh, in order to drive progress faster. But uh, right now it seems unlikely because everyone sits on still very high valuations and uh, which makes it just kind of hard to, to cooperate sometimes. And I um, also think money is still invested into the wrong things. So if you look at how VCs are investing, they're still investing mostly in infrastructure projects like another mm -hmm. layer two <laughs> or like another, I don't know, middle layer protocol and uh, I think what we need would need a lot more is actually applications um, that can drive more adoption because that's what really is clearly lacking to me but I, I see that most VCs are too afraid 
uh, or not knowledgeable enough to 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 take those risks um, of betting on single applications, and everyone mm -hmm. rather invest to the like hundred uh, like layer two technology, which will also have no users. Um, but yeah, that's just how it is. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with this apps point. Like for me, you know. It's uh, very strange that, uh, you know, there are so many entrepreneurs in the space already, so many developers, but still like most of them lean into this infrastructure side. And, and, and then that's also because, as you said, like VCs are more happy to fund the infrastructure because they think, okay, like if you invest in layer one or layer two and it grows, then you you know, get value and money from all transactions that are going on there. Or if you invest in another RPC provider, then you get money. It's like, you know, picks and shovels and so on. But I, I, I'm, I, I'm here with you because apps are definitely necessary right now. And, and, yes. and, and, I, and I think, yeah. Yeah, just one comment to this. Also, yeah, I think what people misunderstand is like, it's actually much easier to change technology, then uh, make users move. And I think we'd all agree with that. Like, for example, on Gnosis chain, um, we can change even the most fundamental part of the network, which is the consensus, right? Also on Ethereum, obviously the same. We go from proof of work to completely different consensus proof of stake <laughs> without uh, changing the user behavior. And it would be extremely difficult actually to make users, um, for example, just upgrade their wallets. Everyone has to upgrade their wallets or contracts, right? To just say, okay, we have in parallel now the proof of stake Ethereum that doesn't work. Everyone agrees this doesn't work. At the same time, whereas the user, of course, the user's owned by wallets um, or the user's owned by applications. <laughs> and uh, that's why my view actually value capture will be more on this side ultimately uh, than on the infrastructure layers below that, because right? mm -hmm. they are, they, most of them can be commoditized and, um, most of them don't really have strong network effects. And so, yeah, I'm not too bullish mm -hmm. on this, on, on purely investing into infrastructure. <laughs> yeah, me neither. So Stefan, like what are your favorite web free projects? Uh, outside, of course, of CalSwap, <laughs> Gnosis Train, and Safe. Uh... For me, it's really kind of every project that really tries to embrace new user groups, bringing them to to our technology. So, to give one example, is uh, VitaDAO. So, mm -hmm. VitaDAO is a DAO that is focused on longevity research and investments, and um, they were very successful in fostering a community of domain experts in longevity uh, around their DAO and they're able to um, sponsor grants to uh, like new initiative, new interesting initiatives in this field. They're able to invest and they're even able to capture the value of those investments into a new product they created called IP NFTs, uh, which is then a real world asset on, uh, on our networks. And uh, this, I think it's a great yeah, great innovation and uh, a great way to kind of embrace a completely new community. Um, and I think also generally science can benefit a lot from the, let's say, open source movement that generally, I think, help to, to obviously foster the blockchain ecosystem as well. And um, those kinds of projects I find super exciting. So for me, really anything that kind of tries to expand <laughs> uh, the users today on those networks, I think generally DAOs can help a lot here as well. Vita DAO is a good example. But I would also expect that there are more initiatives being driven by, by DAOs, especially because um, like capital formation, like fundraising is something where obviously blockchain shines. I think everyone would agree that that's a clear product market fit for, for blockchain. And uh, I think there will be a lot more DAOs using blockchain for that purpose uh, that might also have some political motivation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, also a big fan of this DSI movement. Uh, I, I also heard about one project where people who have very rare diseases that, you know, are too, like they, it doesn't make economic sense for pharmaceutical companies to develop drugs to cure them because they have too small 
total addressable market. Uh, like they can, you know, connect and together fundraise development of some uh, drugs or, or even just hire researchers to look at whatever has been developed so far and maybe try to, you know, cure their own problems. So this is something really, really, really beautiful, you know, uh, application of, of DAOs here. So, so Stefan, like last two questions uh, here. Uh, First one is where people should go to learn more about Gnosis. What's the best place? Is it Twitter, Discord, website, or any other place on the internet? Yeah, the best is just going to gnosis.io and there you have links to our forum, to our documentation, to the Discord and so on. Uh, also would like to promote the safe, like uh, safe dot global is where you learn everything about the safe. The topic of account abstraction is actually very important to both safe and gnosis chain. So we really want to promote account abstraction. Um, and, uh, yeah, on the safe website, you also have all the links that like tell you how to integrate it. There's actually still a hackathon going on where you can, uh, like try to utilize the new SDK that we developed with the gnosis safe. It allows you to take advantage of account abstraction. So that is something you should definitely also take a look at. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, one last thing, like, you know, we had this conversation about building. You are definitely a very accomplished builder <laughs> in the in the space. So I'm wondering, you know, do you know any other people like you that might be a good fit for the con conversation that we just had? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I would recommend actually getting Adam Levy on this podcast as well. So he is a, he is a founder of Backed Finance, which I mentioned, which creates these one-to-one mm -hmm. -one bank assets. But he's also a real crypto OG, and he has a very interesting story as well. He actually was uh, the co-founder and CTO of DAO Stack, which was one of the first um, like DAO frameworks um, that had very interesting innovations as well. Um, and yeah, I think he would be a cool person to talk to for sure. Okay. So Stefan, like, thanks a lot for coming and sharing these OG stories with us and also, you know, shedding new light on Gnosis chain, because I, I think this is like this very under the radar project, sort of like, you know, uh, ver yes. very few people are aware that it even exists. They use POAs, but they have no idea that it's a Gnosis chain. And uh, I think you are building very, very revolutionary, I might even say things. So I am really crossing my fingers and I, I hope that you will succeed with getting the zero point to five percent to like at least one percent that will be amazing yeah we'll definitely try and uh, i think uh we have been around for a while we will be around for a while and uh, it's obviously nothing that changes from one day to another and we are generally not uh, fond of like just driving pure speculation but rather building fundamentals by first principles and uh I, yeah, I'm confident uh, that we can succeed, but I agree with you. Uh, we have to increase visibility. So this podcast might help. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll do my best to promote it as, as much as I can. Uh, awesome. So yeah. thanks a lot, Stefan. And, you know, have a good evening, I guess, because you are in Europe as well, as far as I know. Uh, yes, yes, I'm based in Lisbon, yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. <laughs>